Mammoth flesh the guns of Green and Wayne Fierce they roared the tide of battle Take the sword was he could slay And foremost facing death and danger Hessian horse and grenadier In the vanguard fiercely fighting Stood an Irish cannoneer Loudly roared his ardent cannon Mingling ever in the strife And beside him fear and daring Stood his faithful Irish wife Her bold contempt for danger Green and Lee's brigades could tell Everyone knew Captain Molly And the army loved her well Towards the roar of battle, round them swiftly flew the iron hail. Forward dashed a thousand bayonets that lone battery to assail. From the foam and foremost columns swept a furious fusillade, mowing down the mass battalions in the ranks of Green's brigade. The frigid winter of 1777 through 1778 was one of stark contrast between the colonial and Crown's forces. While General Washington and the Continental Army endured much suffering at the Valley Forge encampment in Pennsylvania, British forces under General Howe experienced a relative winter of ease in occupied American capital of Philadelphia. Redcoats would receive hero treatment as liberators from a large loyalist population in America's largest, most prosperous city. The rebel Congress, along with staunch patriot leaders, had fled the city, and those sympathetic to the cause of independence remained silent and meek in fear of reprisals. Little did the British know that their pleasant winter provided by the King's loyal subjects in Philadelphia would cause a moral and logistic dilemma in 1778. Sir Henry Clinton, the unsatisfied number two of General Howe, had requested a transfer. His transfer away from America was denied. However, a promotion he did not want was ordered. General Howe, fat and passive, being enchanted in Philadelphia, resigned his command. He no longer wished to commit to the aggravation of war. Clinton would assume command of His Majesty's North American forces and immediately see the entire scope of the war change. Within days of taking command, he learned that this rebellion would expand into a world conflict. The French, emboldened by American victories at Saratoga the prior year, had its Caribbean fleet on the way, and Clinton risked being blockaded and surrounded in Philadelphia. Clinton would have to leave the continental capital and reestablish headquarters in New York. He could have quickly boarded his men and supplies and been there in a week, but that would leave all those loyalists subject to any reprisals rebels wished to inflict upon them re-entering Philadelphia. This moral dilemma became a logistical hardship that would lead to the second action at Monmouth. Clinton, a man of honor, sent the refugees aboard his ships, sending them along with as many of supplies and troops as possible. The rest would march through New Jersey to New York. At times, they would be forced into a single 10-mile-long column due to the lack of infrastructure in, in many rural parts of Nova Caesarea. He knew at these choke points, he would be prime target for hit-and-run harassment, and Washington didn't disappoint here. Clinton also knew, though Washington was cautious, that he still may look to face him in a large action if he could come upon the right place and right time. Here, Washington also didn't disappoint. General Washington often confused his own officers while shadowing Clinton across New Jersey. He would augment harassing troops with large numbers of elite forces. This brought criticism from his number two, General Lee, who felt that if Washington wanted a battle, he wasn't giving the crack troops enough soldiers, and if Washington meant simply to harass, then this was far too much of a deployment. But no one knew at the time, as Washington had information to be wary. He believed either the British may have turned one of his commanders, or that possibly Lee would sabotage his strategy to usurp him based on a letter to Congress Washington's intelligence had intercepted. We believe Washington's seemingly erratic appointments were meant to give him the ability to converge upon Clinton's army with sufficient force without risking them tipping off the British or an unthinkable plot by his own number two. It is quite possible if it were not for Lee's assumptions, disregard for Washington's orders, and poor clerical correspondence of plans leaving some of the best troops out of the early actions on the 28th, that Washington's chess moves would have worked at Monmouth. Late in June, the two armies finally grew near, and the time and place was right for Washington to force an action against the rearguard. After General Lee initially declined to lead this force, it was given to Marquis de Lafayette. Then, in a childish manner, as described in letters by Alexander Hamilton after the battle, Lee demanded to be put in charge of this force again. When Clinton hunkered down with his rear around Monmouth Courthouse, Washington gave instructions to Lee to station about 600 men to watch the movements of Clinton and launch an attack as soon as the column went underway. Lee declined to do this. This would end up foiling the entire plan for a morale-boosting victory at Monmouth.
days before Monmouth, chaotic weather had impeded Clinton's columns. On the 26th, they settled around Monmouth Courthouse. Clinton first expected a general action from the Continentals. Having good intelligence, he knew Washington was near, and the ravine heavy terrain meant many bridges. With rebel militia destroying bridges and damaging roads, he began to prepare. After no action happened on the 27th, Clinton now expected Washington to attack his rear guard at a choke point and attempt to capture his baggage in a limited engagement. Clinton got his wagon train out just behind his forward division about 4 a.m. and had much more than his rear guard available in case Washington became bold. Lee disregarded Washington's thought for advancing 600 or so men to keep an eye on the rear guard near courthouse. Lee's failure to heed Washington's command left him totally unaware and ill-prepared for what Clinton had in store. The general plan that Lee intended at this point, using far more discretion than prudent, was to circle the rear guard around the courthouse, then diverting troops to meet Morgan's men and devastate the wagon. The two major issues is that Lee, through clerical arrow, never relayed this to Morgan, and the most important is the wagons would not be there, just a waiting Clinton determined to keep the Americans at bay and get to New York before the French arrived. Just after 5 a.m., Lee and the American vanguard set towards Monmouth Courthouse to enact Lee's plan to surround Clinton's rear guard. As we said, a plan altered from the one Washington and company decided during the officer meeting on the 26th. Lee later stated that he believed he had discretion. However, this caused unprofessional confusion and disorder while marching to the objective. This pompous mistake by Lee only compounded the initial assault as Clinton was ready and lined up along the road to the courthouse with his baggage long gone. Lee did manage to assemble a line, and the two forces engaged in an artillery duel. This until Clinton's 42nd Highlanders, among other units from the center column, rejoined the rear guard, shaking Lee's nerve. The Americans displaying a shaky line began to falter as Lee failed to take charge of the situation and issue orders for continuing the objective. This caused some fallback, then causing the impudent Lee to order a retreat that began to turn chaotic. Although the artillery duel had gone on for hours until the 42nd arrived and continued for the better part of an hour, Lee failed to move artillery and units to the well-located hill behind his line to cover his retreat. Matters were made worse as there was no semblance of order to the retreat and Lee's path took more than half his line around the hill endangering units of Dragoons and Maxwell's Jersey line from being cut off if Clinton would wheel his left flank down. This would have continued to rout Lee's right flank while encircling his left. Luckily, Washington had heard of the disorderly retreat, and Lee's disregard for the council's determination rode up meeting Lee along the road and stabilizing the situation, preventing the possibility of a wheel maneuver by Clinton. No longer prone, the left of the Continentals continued an isolated battle for most of the day, where a cavalry battle raged, moved along, and then re-engaged, while much of the Jersey line held up a significant portion of Clinton's returning center column for most of the day. This until finally they were able to withdraw and rejoin the main force in the rear of where Washington ordered his organized defensive line. These actions allowed Washington to set a moving defensive line. Falling back, the Continentals held the comparable British force up with an intense artillery duel and several bayonet charges. The Americans covering the stabilized retreat to the rendezvous points Washington ordered. Both sides exchanged, taking, then giving up ground as Washington lured Clinton to a stronger American position. Washington had ordered General Green, accompanied by General Knox, who was present during this retreat, to take a significant amount of the rebel artillery and move it to the top of a hill on the other side of the Wemmerick Creek, overlooking the field where Washington intended to make a stand. It would take hours. The Americans would have to bend, not break, during this fallback, giving Knox and Green time to outflank the unaware Clinton. This went on for several hours on the hottest day of 1778. The intense heat drained both sides and added significantly to the casualties. This is where one of the most storied events of the battle occurred, the legend of Molly Pitcher. Heroines Mary Ludwig Hayes and Margaret Corbin both took over gunner positions during the vicious battle. Hayes for her fallen husband and Corbin for another fallen soldier as she made her rounds with water. There may have been other unidentified women who took up arms at Monmouth, Regardless, the actions of these women boosted the morale and hardened the resolve of the contents of the army fighting during these critical moments of the afternoon of June 28, 1778.
The American folk hero, Molly Pitcher, originally the common name for a woman who brought water up to the fight, became a composite of these two women and their deeds. In the end, Washington was successful in reestablishing his intended defensive line between a large ravine and the bend of Lemrock Creek. The battle continued as it did for much of the day, both sides exhausted, Clinton questioned continuing the battle as Washington now was controlling a strong position and no longer gave up ground. Getting near 5 p.m., Clinton felt continuing the battle was futile. Secure in that his withdrawal could not be pursued, and fulfilling the purpose of securing his marching provisions, Clinton began evacuating the field, starting with his 3rd Brigade on his right flank, each successive unit covered by the 42nd Highlanders. Around 545, Green and Knox had successfully established a battery atop of the hill, bearing down and unleashing on Clinton's left flank. Seeing the retreat, the Continentals would engage in its first offensive in six hours. This with a series of bayonet charges. Mad Anthony Wayne requested 1,300 men to dagger the retreat by Spotswood Middlebrook Bridge. Washington denied, expecting to resume the battle the next day, but Wayne was allowed to take 400 men, where he caused significant casualties to an isolated group of some 650 grenadiers before they were relieved. The British feign settled for the night about a mile away from the American force. Clinton had no intention of returning to battle here the next day and slipped his men away during the night, reaching where the Hessian General Nyfausen had encamped some three miles from Middletown around 8.30 a.m. the next day. Monmouth flashed the guns of Green and Wayne Fiercely roared the tide of battle Take the sword was seen put slain Foremost facing death and danger Hessian horse and grenadier In the vanguard fiercely fighting Stood an Irish cannoneer Loudly roared his ardent cannon Mingling ever in the strife And beside him fear and daring Stood his faithful Irish wife For bold contempt for danger Green and Lee's brigades could tell Everyone knew Captain Molly And the army loved her well Towards the roar of battle round them swiftly flew the ardent hail Forward dashed a thousand bayonets that lone battery to assail From the foam and foremost columns swept a furious fusillade Mowing down the mass battalions in the ranks of Green's brigade 